next spot. Uh, from there we go to uh, deep water fisheries, I think. Uh, long line catches. Uh, so uh, we're going to listen to Anais. And uh, after that, we have, we're going to have a small discussion, I hope, uh, on this. So good luck with your uh, talk. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, my presentation is not completely wrapped up because I already read this and things, but let's hope that's okay. So yeah, let's start. Um, oh god, okay. Uh, well, it was a species um, diversity and assemblage um, of deep water fishes around Condor Seamount. So I was looking at the spatial and methodological viability of longline catches. Um, Okay, first of all, um, what's a seamount? A seamount is a mountain under the sea. Um, mostly they are of volcanic origin. They can be small or big. They can be shallow or deep. And looking at this global map, we can already see that seamounts are common features in all oceans. And considering that of the millions of seamounts that are estimated to exist, only about 300 have been studied so far, we can already say that um, the knowledge on these ecosystems are, is really sparse. And um, well, commonly they are referred to um, as hotspots of productivity, mainly for the large and shallow seamounts, but also um, hotspots of biodiversity, like here seeing coral, deep sea coral gardens on tundra seamounts in the study area. Um, in the Azores, where the study took place, um, there's more than 400 seamounts that are estimated to exist. And some of them, mainly the large ones, and reaching into shallow depths, are important areas for fishing. As Jesper already said, bottom trawling is forbidden in the Azores, and less destructive uh, long lines and hand lines are commonly used. But despite these less destructive methods, there's still recent concerns of overfishing of some species. Now, the study area from the Simon, it's a unique case of an area protected for research only. You can see here the borders of the um, area that is forbidden now to, to fish around Condor Seamount, and there's longline surveys conducted every year um, with two types of longline gears that would be important for them. So here you can see the um, longline surveys of one type of longline gear here on the north flank, of the south flank, and of the far field station. So imagine you make a cut through here. That's the, this picture now that you can see, and uh, my study aims was to compare first using one type of longline gear um, to compare the large and shallow seamount condor to a comparison area which is called the Far Field Station in similar depths. And I wanted to see whether the long line catches um, vary between these two sites or whether they are rather similar. What we expected in the beginning was that the larger seamount that raises into shallow depths is more productive, as is commonly stated in seamount um, papers about it. And um, the deeper and smaller seamount that is not reaching into upper productive layers would be less productive. So we, of course, um, took um, a step study area in the, in the same depth range um, because the species distributions is really yeah, stratified by depth or changes with depth. And considering the species composition, we didn't expect really big differences because the distance of 20 nautical miles between the, the two sites is not really yeah, a large thing considering the mobility of these organisms that we're looking at. Then the second study aim was um, to compare the variability of longline catches depending on the longline that was used. So there was two types of longline that I commonly used, as I said before. There is LLA that I did a drawing here and longline B. Um, the gears are structurally relatively different, uh, relatively similar, as you can see here. They're having a main line and a safety line, and the hooks apply to them. Um, but they vary in factors like the fishing position, the soak time, the hook size, um, and the density of the ploid hooks. Um, the long line A is commonly used to uh, catch shallow species like the black spotted sea bream or the black belly rose fish, and it's deployed along the slope of the seamount. And um, yeah, fish is relatively close to the bottom. Whereas long line B is adapted to catch species with more sharp teeth, like the black scavengers, often fish, often long push, and it also fishes um, in the water column relatively far off the bottom. So the methods I used for this was first univariate analysis to compare more in general the overall catches, for example, the number of species, 
the weight, so the catch per unit effort and the weight per unit effort. Also, other parameters like the number of species and generalizations for the community, like the evenness and Shannon index. And this was done in R, and I also used Primer software to do multivariate analysis, looking more in depth at the species composition. So I also did Permanova, PCO plots, and simple analysis. <coughs> now to my results. First of all, the spatial variability between the Farfield Station and Fulgrosima using Long B. So um, we found that here the condor is the two samples um, together, at the north wing and at the south wing that I showed before. So we found that the catch per unit effort and the weight per unit effort actually did not significantly vary between the two sites. Neither did the number of species that we found. But it has to be said that the variability between the north flank and the south flank on Condor was relatively large. Then the evenness and the diversity index, the Shannon index I used here, um, were significantly lower at the far field station than on Condor. And there was predation uh, resulting in catch rates only of heads that were also lower at the far field station than on Condor. Now going to, this, uh, to the multivariate analysis, um, we can see in this PCO plot a clear uh, difference between the far field station, which samples to group here, and Condor Seamount. And um, the far field station is clearly dominated by this species, the great lantern shark, Atmopterus princeps. Um, watch out, the scale here is not proportional to the real size of the fish, but to the importance to the community. So this fish is really, really dominant species at the far field station, whereas at Condor, the species composition is more equilibrated with uh, species like the black scampard fish or the Portuguese dogfish that occur in more even numbers there. Now to the comparison between the two lines. We have um, a consistent trend of long line A having smaller catch rates, the weight is lower, the number of species is also lower, the size and the length of the animals that are caught, and the percentage of heads as a product of predation is consistently lower for long line A than for long line B. So, as I said before, there was factors that varied between the two beers, and so we already expected different results, but these results actually may reflect um, responses of the community to these factors. So, it's, um, Looking at the species composition, we can again see a clear difference between long line B and long line A. So it's not surprising that the factor here in our Permanova was the most significant um, result, explaining most of the variation of the fish assemblages. Other factors that were significant was the year and the location. Um, also, we found a trend for more species with sharp teeth caught by long line B whereas um, long line A had higher catches of the very abundant species at the step of Muramuru. And the species, interestingly, um, has high temporal fluctuations, despite it gets relatively old. So this long line A head was more um, contributing to the temporal variability that we found. Now discussion, these results, what, results, what do they mean? So between Condor and the Fafir station first, we, um, contrary to our expectations, we found no difference in the abundances between Condor and the Fafir station. Um, also, the catches at the Fafir station were, as I mentioned before, there was a difference in the north flank and the south flank. So, um, interestingly, the north flank had higher catches than the south flank consistent. And uh, the catches on the north flank were actually more similar to the far field station. And in the literature, you commonly find uh, the notion that the north flank has an elevated productivity. But now comparing it to the far field station that has similarly high catches, we should maybe rather conclude that the south flank has um, more impoverished um, yeah, abundances. Um, then the species composition was clearly different between the two sites, mainly because of the dominance of the Amokterus princeps at the far field station. So, um, well, the species, we, we don't know much about it. So, 
describing this pattern in relation to the biology of the species is not really possible. And also at the Farfield station, we don't really have um, much data on environmental variables. So this really limits our ability to conclude in terms of ecological factors. Now between the two gears, we can say that the catches vary very greatly between the two catches, uh, between the two gears. And that was not only in the catch rate as well as in the different species composition. So um, in terms of the catch rate, probably that was because um, the line long line A was more demersal, whereas long line B was more in the water column, and that probably has an effect of the on the species that are targeted, so that would be explaining the species composition. And the higher catch rates in general are probably an effect of the longer times that long line B stayed in the water, so there's more chance of the fish to find the prey. But um, yeah, also in the next factor, yeah. And while concluding on this, we can see that depending on the method used, even though the gears are relatively similar, um, still we get a clearly different picture on the community depending on the methodology used. One factor that was um, having a changing in both between Condor and Fafir station and between long line B and long line A was the predation from the hooks. So we found higher predation at Condor than at the Fafir station. Um, why is this? Could be an effect of more high level predators eating the fish from the line at Condor. But also there was an effect of more tasty species maybe at Condor because it was mainly the black scabbard fish and the common moona that were eaten from the hook. So that could be an effect that these species are also occurring more around Condor and that could be the reason why this happens more often around Condor. Then in long line B also we found um, more predation on LLB than on long line A, which is probably related to the fishing position in the water column. As it's fishing higher, probably there's a more aggressive fish in the water column with the uh, yeah, predation occurring there. And also long line B has longer soak time, so again also the, the predators have more chance to encounter their prey. So in conclusion, we can state that the spatial and methodological variability was only partly found when looking at the univariate analysis, but clearly found when um, looking at species assemblages. And some patterns found in this case study, as I explained before, were not in accordance from what we expected before, so there's still a lot of research needed to, yeah, to have a better picture on seamounts and the variability that occurs within that. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you for the presentation. Question time? Okay, no questions? Okay, that's, uh, I have one. Um, you say you talk about communities. But uh, you only look at limited top 13 species. 16. You have 16. So yeah. To my feeling, it's a very limited yeah. uh, number of species for if I know a bit the, the region, there's a lot more yeah. occurring there. So can you really talk about communities there? And what about, let's say, the other taxa, invertebrate taxa? What is the total? Uh, if you would have put out those long lines 100 or 150 meters further, for example, would you come up with completely different results, for example? Or? Well, generally, the species assemblage of these fish is... I don't know. I, don't, I mean, yeah. we expected not to have that many differences in the community. So generally, as they have high dispersal, also you wouldn't expect them to be that clearly different. But also, it was mainly demersal fish, or at least related to the bottom. So of course, they are looking at the structures that they have. So still, I mean, of course, there's limitations because not all species are also attracted to the long line, and you for sure have to, like, yeah, the selectivity of the gear. But still, the, the predators are also saying something about the community and. I mean, there's a lot of interactions going on, so still it's a valuable approach to, yeah. to compare between Do them. Do you have an idea from where those predators come? What is their range? Their, uh... 
it depends for the Epimpterus princeps, the virus is really, really unknown, but there is hypothesis that they migrate along the mid-Atlantic ridge, even though the fish is like, big like this, they can swim enormous, enormous distances, so the dispersion for sure is very big. So in how far, what I mean with this question, how far are they related <laughs> to the area where you deploy the technique? Well, but interestingly, I had four different years that I put it, and the differences between the years were not that big, especially between the long IV that I compared in the beginning. There was a consistent trend of so many Edmonderus princeps found in the far field station, where there was consistently none at Condor. Despite that they could easily swim there, there was none. So I think the community structure is really more or less stable over time. That gives me at least some, yeah, I'm optimistic that it is more or less robust for this time period. From a marine biodiversity conservation point of view, which technique would you advise? To a sample? Or, yeah. Well, I mean, bottom crawling is a lot worse, but still, of course, it's an invasive method. Yeah. And, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, I spent two days on a long liner, and it's, yeah, there's a lot of sharks being fished and killed for, for this, of course. Um, but also, there's papers comparing the results of condor at least for um, the non-invasive methods like video surveys and you don't find the same results so the both methods I think they're valuable but they are really getting you different pictures so having no long lines at all is also not an option as only having video surveys. But if you have to make a, yeah. a, if you have an impact assessment that has to be done for example and uh, they ask you okay you have one day in the day to go out sampling which thing yeah. would you advise to, to get the, the Well but these picture? surveys are done once a year yes. and it's not that many lines that are applied so the catch numbers well for this study it was four years um, a lot of sampling stations and 600 fish that were used for this comparison, so... Yeah, I don't know, I, yeah. A video service also makes sense to me, yeah, of course. But, yeah. Okay. It's an, yeah. Any questions? You won't really have an effect? Well, <laughs> I know it's uh, I mean, the topic of uh, you look at specifically. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I look at the depth, yeah, yeah. but I mean, for, for shallow depth, for sure it has an effect. That's pretty obvious. But looking at the deeper sites, especially around Condor, I would still say yes, because the community on the north flank, where the current arrives, is really, there's higher catch rates, there's more productivity in this case for the fishes, there's more species, a bit more. And also there's, with this more predation, I think the higher, like, the broader community that is supported there also supports more high level predators. So I think even though it's at the depth, still the mesopelagic around Condor, that these were found to really be an important link between the euphotic layers and the, the deeper strata. So I would say yes, there's, there's an effect of the sea yeah. Stomach content? No, there's data available, but I don't know. Okay.